And we have access Can we get more of that? I'm sorry? Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're just uh, welcoming, welcoming people into the room. And as soon as we reach critical mass, we'll get started. Hey, everybody. A hundred and seven. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sharice Kearns, and I'm co-chair of the NAACP Arlington Branch Education Committee. We are still in the process of letting attendees into the room. So if you'll bear with us for uh, a couple of minutes, um, once we get to critical mass, we had nearly, um, nearly 400 uh, RSVPs. So, um, so we're gonna give, uh, give JD a chance to get some more people into the room and we'll get started. Um, welcome and thanks for coming out tonight.
Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Sharice Kearns, and I am co-chair of the NAACP Education Committee. Um, thank you so much for coming out and joining us tonight. Um, this is our first event of its kind. We hope it's not the last. We are particularly honored to be holding this on the um, on International Women's Day. So that's that's, you know, another great honor for us. So what we're doing here tonight is we are doing a screening of the documentary um, Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools. Um, the documentary, of course, is based on the um, book by Monique Morris. And the way this is going to run tonight is once we get everyone in the room, we are going to have a screening of the documentary. And then we have a wonderful moderator, Ms. Avril Somerville, who's going to guide us through some uh, discussion about this um, very important topic. So, um, you know, we're really excited to have you here and, um, you know, we'll, we'll get started in a few minutes. Um, <sighs> let's see. What do we got? Are we up to? We're up to 200 participants. So, and and counting. I know. Ooh, ooh. So when when Simone and I, my my co-chair Simone Walker, who's also in the room, when we when uh, Leah Matterall proposed this to us, it's something that we always wanted to do as part of the Ed Committee, but. Um, we didn't anticipate such a wonderful response. So we are just, we're just very pleased. And I really want to thank um, Leah Matterall and Laurel Langhorn, who were instrumental in getting this up off of the ground and getting it set up. Leah has done an incredible amount of technical work and Laurel did some great outreach work and some planning. So we are just, you know, grateful to them for all of their effort because, um, because without them, we wouldn't be here tonight. So I just wanted to give them my, my deepest thanks and appreciation for that. Um, and I'm just checking the chat to see if anything else is going on in the chat. So um, before we get started, let's see. And we're still getting people into the room. Before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator. Um, when Simone and I met her and talked to her, we were just so blown away by her presence and her energy and, of course, her knowledge base. Um, again, her name is Avril Somerville, and she is in, in Sheltonham Township, Pennsylvania, the beauty of a virtual world is now that we can access all of this talent from wherever they might be at the time. So we really, Avril, appreciate you coming out and talking with us. Um, Avril is a, is a native of the Commonwealth of Dominica but she moved here as a child. So she is, she is also very much American as well. So we take, we take, we take all of our, our diaspora as diaspora where we get it and we love all of it. Um, Avril is a writer and a speaker and an educator. She is currently teaching high school um, in Sheltonham, Sheltonham Township. And she uh, is an author. She has one ebook that she has written that is called, uh, here, let me get my glasses together. Uh, a Journey of Life on Purpose, Creativity, Love, Womanhood, Race, Community, and Identity. Um, and she's working on her second book, 
which um, she is doing inquiries. So she's still working on it. And it's called How Dare You Say Goodbye. So um, once, let's see how many people. 227. So what we're going to do is I want to give you a little bit of housekeeping. We think that the, um, the video is going to run better if you turn off your video in Zoom and watch the, D well, we, we have a DVD. So you'll watch the video, but you'll turn your video off. And what that does is conserves bandwidth um, so, that, so that the video will be able to run in Zoom. If you did not receive a copy of the discussion guide, um, we have links to the discussion guide in the chat that you can download and you'll be able to use to make notes, write questions for the discussion period. And then once we're finished, um, we can go right into, into the discussion. So I'm gonna, gosh, we're still, <laughs> we're still ticking up. So, so let's let's give it a couple more minutes, and um, because I want to get as many people in before we start the video as possible. So, um, if you guys will bear with me for a little bit, then we'll go ahead and get started. Once if we once we reach two fifty, maybe I'll feel comfortable. <laughs> like, okay, we're at two fifty. We'll, we'll go ahead and launch the video, but let's let's see how many more people we're going to get in the room. Wow. We're at 240, Cherise, so we're close. I, I know, I know, it's amazing. I mean, and I know that this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And it's just so wonderful to know that there is a collective out there who is just as interested in the welfare of black girls and young black women as I am. So I'm, I'm really hoping that this is going to be the beginning of not just dialogues, but action. Um, because, and while we're waiting, I'll go ahead and, and tell you guys, as I was preparing for this and thinking about this, I went back and I looked at some of the data here in Arlington County. And we had a meeting back in the fall with, uh, with some people from the court system. And what we found out was that for detention admissions in Arlington, uh, we had eight black girls who were admitted to detention, uh, two Latinas and two white girls. So the disparities are stark here, as you can see, even though we're not talking about great numbers, we still are talking about this disparity that exists in how uh, young Black girls and women are treated in terms of criminal justice and interaction with criminal justice. When I went to look back at suspension data to see how that worked out, um, <laughs> Arlington County Public Schools does not disaggregate their suspension data by gender. They disaggregate it by race, but not by gender. So we do not have a line of sight into what's going on with black girls or black boys or Latinos or anyone else in terms of gender uh, when it comes to suspension. So that that was just an interesting tidbit that, that I realized as I was going back uh, looking at data. And we are at 250. Leah, do you want to go ahead and start the video? Yes, I'll get it started. Fingers crossed. I've practiced a lot of times. <laughs> I think you're going to do fine.
and I'm going to mute my video as well and my This video went viral, but it's not unique. Incidents like this can be found in every corner of America. From major cities to small towns. Punitive discipline creates a disproportionate criminalization of black girls and disrupts one of the most important factors in their lives, education. Dear black girl, I want you to know that you are sacred and loved. Black girls are sacred and loved. Black girls, you are sacred and you are loved. Black girls are sacred and loved. You are loved, you are sacred, you are powerful, and you are precious. Black girls are sacred and loved. Black girls are sacred and loved. I want to tell all the black girls out there that you are sacred and that you are loved. Black girls, you are sacred and loved. Black girls are sacred and they're loved. Black girls, you are sacred and loved. Resilient, immeasurable, unstoppable, indispensable, brilliant. Black people are eternal, ancient ancestors of the entire planet. Black people are breathtaking, the creators of this nation, the cornerstone of liberation. Black people are genius. Black people are people on a mission to get free by any means necessary. Black people are my heart, my soul, my breath. Black people are the source. Black people are a gorgeous rebellion by the simple act of being born. Hello, everybody. I am not going to take any time. I'm going to pass this over to Avril. There is so much packed in that film. It was my first time seeing it, and I am just full up. I'm full up. So I'm yeah. going to turn it over. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming and watching the film, and, and I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, some of you may have missed the introduction, but I just want to assure you that I'm invested in this conversation. Um, I am the mother of three children. I am the mother of two um, daughters. Uh, we are Black. We, um, I, I was born in the Caribbean in Dominica, but I am American by um, you know, naturalization. I came to this country when I was about 10 years old. Um, familiar with some of the traumas of having to carve my own unique space in a place that may or may not have, um, you know, retrofitted me into it. So, um, you know, I'm very much familiar as many of you, I assume are familiar with the, the need to belong, the need to feel like you belong, the need to be seen um, and to be uh, integrated into a community that loves and accepts you. Um, so I wanna share with that with you. I'm also an educator. I teach high school, I teach 11th grade. I've, I've also taught first graders in, in the former life. Um, I'm very much an active community member in the Sheltonham community. Um, I see some familiar faces. Um, I am, uh, again, I'm very invested in this conversation and I, I want to um, assure you that I'm coming from a space of community and love and a need to have this restoration in our community and our broader community. Um, one of the things I wanted to note was, um, I, I did see this film once before. I started watching it on my own and then I had my 12 year old daughter join me and um, she had a very visceral response to the film. Um, you know, shared some things with me that I, I did not know about beforehand. Um, so I want to assure you for those of you who may watch it with um, younger children that the film gives them this feeling of space um, they, it gives them this permission, if you will, for them to open up and share some more. So, so we need more artwork. We need more social justice work that allows the conversations, right? That permits our girls to open up, right? So um, as an educator, I see it from a myriad of perspectives. Um, as a parent, as an educator, um, as a community member, I think our role is huge. Um, with regards to this conversation. But one of the things that I've noticed since the pandemic um, is that the pandemic has sat us down, if you will, has sat us down um, and illuminated a lot of necessary shifts that 
just must take place, right? So with the pandemic, we see a lot of we see a lot of the spotlight on racial inequities. We see a lot of the spotlight on health disparities. We see a lot of the spotlight on different outcomes among students, some students who have access to the internet, some who do not, some students who have parental supports, um, some students who do not because the parents have to leave. So we, we're, we're getting to kind of sit with a lot of this for a little lo longer, right? We can't turn a blind eye, we can't just turn away. Um, and this particular film highlighted a lot of these shifts, right? So you heard stories from the girls themselves, that whole first person narrative. You heard from Emma, you heard from Samaya, you heard from Ariana, you heard from Teriana and Kiara, all of whom I fell in love with the first time I saw the film. I was like, oh, I love it, you know, and I'm, I was crying the first time. This time I was kind of processing it as a, a, another viewer, right? And some of the shifts they talked about were from wants to move away from one surveillance to acceptance, moving away from being punitive to um, more accountability, moving away from adultifying our girls to more one of, you know, openness and embracing of this girlhood and this childhood and this coming of age. And then moving from this, they didn't say the word indifference, but I recognize it as a teacher. You know, this is indifference, not my problem. I get to go home. I don't have to deal with this. It's not my family. It's somebody else's kids. Um, we need to move away from that space to a more empathetic lens. And then the last one that I heard was moving away from a deficit lens to a lens of capability. So viewing our girls from um, a place of potential and a place of capability versus viewing them as... Limited, right? So I want to ask, what are some other shifts you think need to take place? Are there some other shifts you heard that that I maybe did not underscore? Um, you know, if you can share that out with the group, that'd be wonderful. Some of the other shifts that we probably need to um, have happen in order for us to move the conversation forward and um, affect the change that we need. One that resonated with me was, was installing practices in the schools so that the first response isn't punitive. Mm -hmm. And we don't have restorative practices here in Arlington yet. We're just starting to kind of implement, well, I don't, we're just starting to begin to think about implementing that into the school. So I think that, that that's a, one thing that was really important to me. And the other thing was was like, compassion mm -hmm. seeing seeing these young women like you mentioned the indifference but seeing them as human beings that have complexities and dimensions and you know I thought that was just such an important thing thank you and someone else said um from feeling alone to feeling a part of community because at the end of the day we all want to belong right we really do we all I think um that's important uh um, Simone, I mean, Sharice, I'm sorry, I'm always mix up the two names. But um, I think uh, a lot of times, that's really what the human self, the individual is striving for, to belong to something, right? And we all know, unfortunately, that if we don't find belonging one place, we'll go find it elsewhere, right? And what we want to avoid is for the push out. We don't want to push girls out into environments that are just counterproductive. And we don't want to push them into environments where they don't realize or actualize their full potential, right? Um, we want to keep them as close to us as possible. Um, so I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate you saying that, looking at them from a lens of compassion as opposed to our automatic response being one to punish, right? Um, okay, I think it starts with a reaction attitude of curiosity. Adults in school should respond to behavior with a desire to ask, what's going on that I can help you with? What's causing the behavior, not why aren't you following the rules, right? So it's not always, it shouldn't be always about compliance. So that's, that's a shift too, right? It shouldn't be all about compliance and conformity. It should be also a, a space where children can actually um, recognize their diversity and be the unique individuals that they are, right? Um, something else that I see a lot of comments coming in, but um, something else that I noticed too is um, 
one of the, it was Jamie, J, it was J, Ms. Jamison, Judge Jamison, when she said, well, you know, sometimes like the way we present ourselves, you know, and someone else said this too, I think it was Monique Moore, like everything, every expression I have is not one of anger. You know, I might be like, mm. you know, like somebody else who knows me can tell like, I'm just tired. I'm not tuning you out, but I'm just like, you know, I might be doing something else, but someone who has established a relationship with me understands these cues, right? For what they actually mean and not as um, indicators of insubordination, right? Um, I always think of, are we so insecure that everyone needs to conform to what it is we, we think, right? Um, are we so insecure that we uh, authority as adults feels threatened every time a child does something that we don't understand. Um, seeking to understand rather than assuming that's a good shift. Nice. Um, every expression I have is not one of anger. Yes. Exploring rather than assuming. So those are, to me, those are like low hanging fruit, right? Those are things that every individual can actually access and, um, and uh, exact, right? But we know that the girls are saying, this looks like love and support. That's what we really want. You know, we want to feel okay. We want to feel seen, what have you. We want to feel supported. We want to feel safe. Those are like basic up the, the Maslow's hierarchy. Everybody wants that. But behind all of that, what are some things that need to happen? Um, for those of you who are, might be educators or just parents, like a, for another parent's lens, what do you think else needs to happen? apart from those warm and fuzzy, low-hanging fruit things that we just talked about? Lack of- Hi, hope. this is, I'm sorry. This is Ashanti yes, from it. GW. Um, yes. Is there a way to, you know, just look at um, the teacher curriculum and how we're training our professionals to interact with all children? As I stated in the chat, um, there are some teachers who come in with you know, with their own implicit bias. So yeah. they look at those tropes and they believe it. The angry black woman, oh, she has an attitude. Oh, it's this or that. Instead of telling the teachers while they're in school getting an education, like, hey, you, these are your students. You, you cannot treat these children like that. Yes, yes. I like that. So embedding some of that instruction and um, training into teacher training because I can, I mean, I know there's some other teachers on here, but um, I can think of a much better use of our professional development days. This is, this is a much better use of the professional development time, um, I think. And I think sometimes too, like during this pandemic, we might think that this is not as immediate because we're not, all of us are not back in the buildings, but I think it's urgent. I think we're gonna be dealing with even more trauma going back into the school buildings, right? And one of the things that I heard was, Traumas don't always have to be like super tragic, but almost all trauma is steeped in loss of some kind. And one of the things that I'm hearing is the right now, the trauma that's not really being spoken is the loss of our girlhood and our childhood and the right to grow the way our bodies are growing, right? That is not something that we are responsible for. We're not responsible for the way our bodies might develop. We, you know, we don't want, girls do not want to be adultified or sexualized, right? Um, so that is a, a, a trauma that it would be traumatic. It would be tragic if we allow more black girls and girls of color to lose their innocence, their childhood, their right to be whoever they are as children. Um, all the more reason, Michael says to preach, all the more reason we need to not only push the for conversation forward, but hold those policymakers and educators and administrators accountable for doing something with regards to this conversation. Like it should not end here. Um, okay, don't think many we men have... understood. Hold on one second. Anika, yeah. Quinana, did you have something that you wanted to add? Hi, Sharice. Thank you. Um, Hi. I, I wrote in the chat and I, I appreciate Stephanie also lifting up Dr. Bettina Love. Yes. Also mentioned in the film. Um, and I can't find what I wrote, but um, basically, you know, you need to approach our girls with love. Yes. And if you don't come from a place of love, then you really need to evaluate that. And so that really, really struck me. Dr. Bettina Love speaks about that as well. Mm -hmm. I find myself as a, as a mother of two black girls. I'm always like, 
feeling like there's something missing with this teacher, mm -hmm. the love, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that really resonated, reson resonated with me. I don't know how you teach that, but what I appreciated in the film was those black women, those elders who were there working, I have to say, working with those white women teachers and holding them accountable. And so I loved seeing that. I love seeing that there were women who were willing to do that work. I'm sure that's very, very difficult work. And I so wish that we would have something like this in APS. Yeah, agree. And, and I'm in Pennsylvania, Anika, and I so wish we had more of that in the school. So that leads me to another question, um, what I'm hearing, because I'm hearing that you do appreciate that kind of not just cultural education, but the whole emphasis on love and some of the work that the Soul Collective and the Emerge Academy um, is doing is, is outside of the school, right? So that makes me wonder, it makes me very curious um, as to whether or not public education can ever fulfill, not, that doesn't mean we let them off the hook, or can schools give us enough of a, um, an improvement in this regard for us to, like, I, I don't know if, I, I honestly do not know how equipped schools are um, to handle this, but they need to be accountable and handle it. I'm saying, I wonder if another component is that cultural education that I really appreciate in the film where um, Tanisha, I think she's from, um, she's from the Soul Collective, right? Where she's teaching about the ancestral connections where the other woman was talking about the poem by Paul Robeson and why the cage bird sings and those connections, those literary connections that are historical and, um, you know, cultural to us, right? So where do you think that responsibility lies? Do you feel it's school plus something outside of school, um, of course, beyond the home, or primarily the school should be doing that work? Where do you believe that work should come from primarily? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm in Virginia and we have people who are working really hard to try to get us to the point where we're ready to think about things like that, but it's going to have to be school plus for us right now because we are so far away from even being able to wrap our minds around a, a history curriculum that includes Black people legitimately. So, you know, trying to broaden that to make it, you know, include, you know, the care of young black girls and women it, it we're not there I mean it, the words are good but the actions are still so far off we as a community are going to have to wrap our arms around our own children and start to figure out how to do this work on our own we can't we can't wait for the school boards for the school systems to do it for us so I, I was going to jump in and just say the same thing that um while, while we may not have the broad curriculum that we're looking for, we can't just sit and wait for that. And so you have to do what you're um, able to do. Um, I work in the same school district as um, Avril does. And um, you know I've been administrator now for only five years, but I was a teacher for many years before that. Mm -hmm. And what I saw a need, I met the need. So that meant for me as an administrator, I'm gonna run a black girls lunch group that meets twice a week with me and I'm gonna buy them lunch and we're gonna sit and we're gonna talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. It meant for me as an administrator, I'm gonna run an after school program called Hip Hop Club, which is really a social justice club, right. which is really learning about our history and I will do that. So mm -hmm. I can't just sit around and wait for the school board to approve a course. I can't right. sit around and wait for teachers to decide when they're going to feel comfortable doing something. Yes, I yes. will do that. Yeah. And when I do it, what I end up doing is bringing people along with me. So right. now it's not just me. Now I have a team of three. It's four of us now. Um, and then each year that will grow. So, you know, we, we can't just sit around and just wait for someone else. You have to do what you can uh, within your circle of influence. Yes, yes. And I appreciate that. And I, I was hoping to hear something along those lines. So I, I really do appreciate that. It's, like you said, we can't wait. 
And I, I really believe that, um, again, this pandemic has sat us down. And I hope it's a period of time where we assess what gifts do we have to bring? You know, what is our purpose here? You know, what, what is our strong suit? Where can we lend our gifts, right? Be, beyond philanthropy alone, right? Where do we show up? Um, how do we use our experiences um, or our own traumas, right, to inform what we do next? Like for me, like I said, I understand the um, feelings of isolation. I understand being singled out. Um, so when I look at my students, I don't just look at them as if they're going through that, but I understand that, right? I can be very transparent. That is one of the qualities I believe that a lot of these um, organizations like the Emerge Academy and Soul Collective did with the students. They were very transparent about their own ACE scores. They were very transparent about the fact that they've gone through some things, right? Um, so there was that relationship that they were building and they had that cultural sensitivity. So during this time, during this season, right? Um, where all of us have been given some kind of grace, I hope that we start to take inventory of what our gifts are and, and what we can do um, to not just move the conversation forward, but to really practice what we believe we say we can recognize as urgent and, and as a crisis. This is what this film does. It centers this conversation. It articulates it as the crisis that it is. So um, you've been given like so much information and um, someone said in the chat that you're not alone. There are many links that Push Out has, you know, um, generously shared with the public. So they've taken away all the excuses that we've ever had, right? So um, take the conversation beyond these boxes. Um, move them forward, hold your administrators accountable, find out what work is being done, partner with other people to make a bigger impact. And um, so, so we can save our girls, so we can save our communities, right? Um, that, that, that's my two cents with regards to that. So I, I'm so pleased, Adesia, that um, you shared your personal story of how you moved, um, shifted from spaces to spaces and to create more space for more girls. Examine your resources. Yes, Suzanne. Thanks, Suzanne Lewis. Yep. And one of the other things is look at your data. Like I like I said in the very beginning, here in Arlington, we have suspension data that is disaggregated by race, but not by gender. So we don't have a way of even seeing the disproportionality as it pertains to our, our girls. We have court data, but we don't have suspension data. So, um, so I've already actually, <laughs> I've already spoken to someone and um, asked for that to be disaggregated. So I did that once I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute, I've been playing with this data for years. How come I didn't notice that? So hopefully, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be getting that data um, disaggregated so that we can see like what's what's happening with our with our minority girls and push back against the school systems because sometimes they don't wanna they don't wanna listen, they don't wanna talk about black girls, they don't wanna talk about discipline. Push. Just don't give up, just right. push. Right. And be visible and vocal, you know, mm -hmm. on behalf of our girls. Like students yep. love students love to hear that people are advocating for them outside of the classroom. Um, really, I mean, they really love to hear that. They like to know that when they see you places, um, when they hear you, when you are authentic. The same way I deal with my students in the classroom is the same way I deal with them in the supermarket. You know what you see is what you get, you know, uh, they know I'm a mom first, they know family matters over everything. And so I'm going to treat them with the same type of, um, you know, respect. Um, don't work in silos. Uh, Susan Lewis had a question. Uh, just a comment, but go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead, please. Um, I found the video so, so um, powerful. I wish it could be shown to teachers everywhere. Um, and uh, it does make clear that, you know, we, we do need teachers. We need more teachers in Arlington, um, uh, teachers of color. Um, I think I, I would find it heartbreaking that so many of 
our black girls have to go through so many years before they find their voices. And as a teacher, you know, I, I feel very responsible for that. And I think one thing um, as a white teacher I can do, we can do is talk to the parents of our black girls and be open, be vulnerable, say, how, how can I help your daughter more? What else can I do? And listen to them, listen to their stories. We are all our stories and our kids have stories. Their parents have stories and we need to listen to them. Um, and I think that connection is often missing in our schools. When we do talk to parents, it's very rushed conferences. It tends to be a, too much about data and not yes. about the child and the family. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yes, because we all have a role to play. You know, I had to examine my own self when I watched the film the first time. I had to ask myself, am I perpetuating this narrative? Or, you know, is there a time when I have done such, you know, reacted to overtly, you know, I had to examine myself. And, um, you know, I have, like I said, when I watched it, I watched it with my 12 year old daughter, only half of it. And that was a, that was quite a wake up call for me. But I do want to echo what Cherie said earlier about having um, not just your daughters watch it with you, but it being intergenerational. Um, the reason we taught we had a conversation offline about this and um, the necessity for the intergenerational connection, um, it was steeped in an observation, something that I learned. Um, after I had that conversation with my 12 year old daughter, I then had a separate conversation with um, with my um, my husband's aunt. She's about 76 years old. And she was a longtime educator, retired educator, but very highly regarded in her circles. And she shared an incident that happened when she was probably about 15 or 16, when she had scored like on an exam, I think it was the SAT, like an, or whatever exam it was. It was nine, she was scored in the 99th percentile. And she had all A's in the classes, but um, in one particular class, well, one, they told her that she must have cheated. So they tried to discount the, the scores. And this was in Media, Pennsylvania. And this was, there weren't a whole lot of black families in the, in the area. It might be more like Arlington now, I don't know. Um, but she was accused of cheating. And then another thing that happened was she said every time she would show up places, she always felt like less than from that one incident in school. Every incident that she talked about that yielded in her feeling like less than and showing up differently was happened in school. So the reason this is important because this is where most children are spending their time. They're spending the majority of their day in school. So the messages that they receive in school matter more than a lot of other messages that they get everywhere else. So it matters that we get this right. It matters that the generations can have different conversations about the varying experiences. And you'll see, unfortunately, that there's a continuum from then to now, right? And this continuum informs the way black women are perceived when we go to the doctors, right? We are perceived as having this, um, this high tolerance for pain, um, you know, dehumanized essentially, you know, as if somehow our sensors don't work. So I need to, for people to be able to see the the whole continuum right i need to see you guys to see how these experiences in school at a very young age play out as adults right how they play out in the doctor's office how they play out in representation everywhere else so yes this is part of structural racism so love and support is important but behind those walls there's a structure that upholds these behaviors and we it's 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 time the reckoning is now we need to eliminate and address that. Yes, the medical issue is deadly. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, are there any other questions for the good of the group? I just wanna make a comment if I can. Um, 
I mean, we're from the state of Connecticut where we do restorative practices and I'm often placed in a position where I am protecting mm. um, Hispanic girls and black girls. I feel like cultural sensitivity needs to be taught to many of the teachers. And we only have but seven hours in a day. And working in an urban school district that's already just crushed by budget cuts and restraints and lack of materials and resources. Um, I've often mentored a lot of students that are going through difficulty. I'm grateful that I can connect, but we need resources. <laughs> we need to be able to refer these young ladies out um, because the teachers are also stressed by timelines and curriculum demands and testing demands. And it's like, when do teachers teach? Like we've become all social workers in a school in some, in some ways. Um, and so we need these resources to help them because in exhaustion, I find a lot of people just become tired and apathetic. And it's like, well, we can't save them all. Well, you know what? If we, can ref if we have the resources and the tools and we can help them in school, identify them in school, but be able to outsource it, if you will, and get them connected with organizations that could uh, give them that support that is difficult to offer in a seven hour time frame when we're pulling them out of class um, to help them socially. I just feel like I need tools, I need resources, and I'll be more than happy to implement them and more than happy to refer these young ladies out to programs. Um, but there's a real, there's a real exhaustion. There's a real need for cultural sensitivity. Yeah. It's been so since I was a young child um, and it's needed today. Yeah. And I wonder if the schools are partnering with these, um, like I can't think of any real partner organization as in Miss uh, Adesia, you can probably talk to me offline about that, but we, we need more of these kind of partners in the community too. Because like you said, the, the schools, and this is not to let them off the hook. I, I will never let them off the hook. Agreed. Um, but yeah, the resources are certainly lacking. Afro? Yes, dear. Hi, I'm this is Lisa Desfi. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for inviting me. So um, I, um, I wanted to kind of just not really address because I'm not I'm not an educator. I'm a, I'm a parent, yeah. but I do work in media and I work um, with sponsorships. So with businesses, um, you know, state legislators. So I'm thinking resource wise, is there a way that especially with the pandemic, and the mental health disparities that have been exposed. Maybe there's a way for the, the, the woman in Connecticut, maybe there's a way for you to maybe put together some sort of grant proposal or, or put together something where, since it's such a heightened awareness now on the mental health disparity right at this moment, now is the moment for you to maybe reach out to you know, maybe a television station or reach out to some sort of, you know, state legislator that's in your district, like your the Congress, the, the commissioner or, you know, the city council person, because I think there are resources there now, like at this present moment, because it's okay. so urgent, it's urgent right now. Okay. And there are so many programs that can actually help and what you guys are need and going back to parents like we live in a pretty decent you know um school district where parents do have resources and parents do have connections but i grew up in philly and when i watched this movie it was like i could see myself all over the place yeah and I, and in my mind i wasn't even that bad but you know i used to fight and you know and all types of stuff my daughter thinks i'm crazy but i think now and I, and I can share some resources with you, Avril, if you want to yes, you know, talk <laughs> offline. Yes. But um, yeah, I have some ideas where I think to direct where you guys may want to go, even in Virginia, 
Well, I mean, there are so many HBCUs there. You guys can recruit teachers to come to Arlington to really try to better reflect the makeup of because I looked at the um yeah, the stats. we're working we're working on that Virginia is full the whole area is full of HBCUs but um we are just we're actually over time but I see Toya's hand so before we wrap up we're going to take Toya and then um then we'll start to wrap things up okay I'll be really quick um are, is there a place that because some it seems like some states have resources and some states don't. Is there a place that we could share a platform? We could share like best practices. I mean, if we had something like that, I mean, like everybody on this call could share what they're doing. For instance, I crochet in a school after school and I teach the girls how to crochet. At the same time, what we do is we build other skills and other things for the child you know, for the girls and the boys who, who may want to attend. So like my program is working. I, I was just wondering is, is if there's a place or a platform where we can share these ideas. I, does anyone know of, I don't know of a platform where we could collectively do that, that wouldn't need to be built out. Oh, there Facebook. you go, Toya. Facebook, Create social one. media. Social media, Facebook. Yes. Um, Sheree, if I may just um, jump in um, before we wrap up. So the NAACP has sent a letter to the, to the Arlington School Board and the superintendent with our budget priorities. And in that letter, we're asking for them to press ahead with implicit bias training um, for our teachers and you know, that's, that was one of the common themes throughout the entire documentary. So to the Arlingtonians on the call, please support us in that, in that measure, write to the school board, write to the superintendent and ask them to prioritize professional development um, for implicit bias training. And so and that's one concrete thing at least we can, we can do. All righty. Well, thank you to everybody. Um, this has been an amazing, amazing evening. Um, thank you all for being here. And I think Avril has one more thing for us before that she's going to send us home with. Um, back to you, Avril. Okay. This is not even part of my work. This is, um, this is the work of Margaret Burroughs, who passed in 2010. And she was a longtime educator. Her and her husband were the founders of the Dusable um, Museum in um, Chicago. And I'm very inspired by her. And I wanted to share this poem with you in the same vein that the Push Out film shared some information with you about Paul Robeson and uh, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing. This poem is called, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black? Reflections of an African-American Mother. So I'm going to read it for you. Um, hopefully it leaves an impression on you and um, uh, calls you to do what it is you are supposed to do with regards to this conversation. What shall I tell my children who are black of what it means to be a captive in this dark skin? What shall I tell my dear one fruit of my womb of how beautiful they are when everywhere they turn, they are faced with abhorrence of everything that is black. Villains are black with black hearts. A black cow gives no milk. A black hen lays no eggs. Bad news comes bordered in black. Black is evil and evil is black and devil's food is black. What shall I tell my dear ones raised in a white world, a place where white mm. has been made to represent all that is good and pure and fine and decent, where clouds are white and dolls and heaven it surely is a white, white place with angels robed in white mm. and cotton candy and ice cream and milk and ruffled mm. Sunday dresses and dream houses and long sleek Cadillacs and angel food is white, all, all white. <laughs> What can I say, therefore, when my child mm. comes home in tears because a playmate has called him black, big lip, flat nose, and nappy headed? What will he think when I dry his mm. tears and whisper, yes, that's true, but no less beautiful and dear? How shall I lift up his head, get him to square his shoulders and look his adversaries in the eye, confident of the knowledge of his worth? 
serene under his sable skin and proud of his own beauty? What can I do to give him strength that he may come through life's adversities as a whole human being, unwarped and human in a world of biased laws and inhuman practices that he might survive? And survive he must, for who knows? Perhaps this black child here bears the genius. Perhaps this black girl here bears the genius to discover the cure for cancer or to chart the course for exploration of the universe. So she must survive for the good of all humanity. She must and will survive. I have drunk deeply of late from the foundation of my black culture, sat at the knee and learned from mother Africa, discovered the truth of my heritage, the truth so often obscured and omitted. And I find I have much to say to my black children, my black girls. I will lift up their heads in proud blackness with the story of their fathers and their father's fathers. And I shall take them into way back time of kings and queens who ruled the Nile and measured the stars and discovered the laws of mathematics upon whose backs have been built with the wealth of continents. I will tell them this and more. And her heritage shall be her weapon and her armor will make her strong enough to win any battle she may face. And since this story is often obscured, I must sacrifice to find it for my children, even as I sacrifice to feed, clothe, and shelter them. So this I will do for them if I love them. Mm. None will do it for me. I must find the truth of heritage for myself and pass it on to them. In years to come, I believe, because I have armed them with the truth, my children and my children's children will venerate me for it is the truth that will make us free. That was the late Margaret Burroughs. I'm going to just put that in the chat in case anybody, oh, you found it, wonderful. Thank you. What shall I tell my children who are black, okay? We will love and support them and we will continue to do this work. Thank you all. Hello, (laughs) Zakia. Hello, beautiful. (laughs) I see so many familiar faces and so many are hiding. Thank you. And thank you so much, Avril. And thanks to everybody for coming. JD, do you want to say a word? The president of our branch is here. Unmute. Where is JD? You did such an amazing job. Great. Thank you. Isn't it amazing? Thanks, everybody. Everyone that's on here, let's give the education committee a round of applause, uh, uh, one of those Zoom claps. And to Avril and Leah, thank you so much. Yep, and Laurel. I don't know if Laurel is here, but thanks to Laurel as well. Yeah, Laurel. Uh, Ms. Somerville, Leah, Cherie, Simone, can you stick, ar- stick around for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. I love Thank you. Everyone. I love Good you, night, everybody. You were phenomenal. Thank I'm so you, proud darling. Of you. Jean Miller. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, I love you, Avril. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. Good night, night, folks. Good night. Good presentation. Good night. This was wonderful.